Hey, and welcome back to this video game animation analysis series, and we're going to talk a little bit more about the animation in Jack and Daxter, which is overall pretty excellent. This isn't really a character animation note, but I like how they have the precursor orbs floating and moving just a little bit. Just enough movement to draw attention. So, speaking of squash and stretch, when you uh, are charged with Blue Eco and you get near these crates here, notice how they start bouncing and wobbling like crazy before they break. Now normally, obviously, wood and metal can't do that, but because this is a cartoony game, you can do that. And in terms of gameplay, it's a really excellent way to visually show the player that something they're doing is changing something. To show that running near these boxes while charged with Blue Eco might cause them to break. I give them a lot of credit for making so many variations of the yeah, we got a power cell uh, celebration moment. I don't know how many there are in total. I want to say like five or six, but uh, yeah, like where Mario 64 and Banjo-Kazooie and so many other games kind of just had the one yay celebration, we got the thing animation. These guys made several and they're all really entertaining. That extra effort really goes a long way towards making this game as charming as it is. Ooh, now we can see them swim. This is a pretty nice swimming animation. I mean, all of their gameplay animations are pretty nice. And, as usual, Daxter's my favorite part. Because <laughs> he's just sitting up there wet and shivering on Jack's shoulder. And I like that they have distinct swimming forward and treading water in place animations for Jack. That's kind of nice. I think this game really serves to show that even if you have low-res assets, you... <laughs> oh, that's great. I didn't know about that. I love the way Daxter peels himself off the floor after a long fall. But yeah, I think this game really serves to show that even when you're working with very low-res assets, and even for the PlayStation 2, the character models and textures in this game are fairly primitive. I mean, even just looking at Jack 2 and 3 on the PS2, you can already see a pretty big improvement in terms of the fidelity of the characters. But even when they're just working with the simpler character models from this first game, they still get a lot of character and charm and appeal out of the way the characters move, and out of the quality of the animation they've made. I think this game serves to show that good animation can go a long way toward making even primitive looking games like this still feel nice and look good. All right, we got another cutscene here. Good training, boys, but that's nothing compared to the challenges that lie ahead. Ah, uh, then no problem. We got the moves, eh, Jack? We'd love to stay in chat, Big Green, but we're uh, itching to get on with our adventures. Fine, fine. Adventure away, then. And while you're out adventuring, uh, why don't you make yourself useful? They do lean a little bit heavily on that 90s cartoon character trend of just give everybody tons of attitude and make them all wisecracking and sarcastic all the time. It'll be funny. And sometimes it is, and the rest of the time it's not really. Now, all of you, get out of here! I'd be really interested to see Naughty Dog try to tackle a Jack and Daxter game again. Like, that studio has grown and refined their craft so much over the last decade, making stuff like Uncharted and The Last of Us, like... And they've got so many great animators and some great writers over there now, I bet they could knock something like this out of the park now. Maybe they will someday. See, they've even got some squash and stretch going on with this crate here. Actually, this is really important. Notice, as the object squashes and stretches, it doesn't just get taller or wider independently. Whether it's squishing down or stretching up, it is always preserving the object's volume. If the object squishes down and gets flatter, it has to become wider as well, because all the volume of that object has to be preserved. Otherwise, stuff's going to look weird and not physical. It looks like scout flies are always in red boxes! Hey, baby! 
What do you say you and I go cruising on this A-grab zoomer? Rule number one, I don't date animals. Ah, uh, you don't know what you're missing. <laughs> Listen, if you need something to keep you busy, my father always talked about an ancient precursor pipeline hidden deep underground. Some of these pipes end in vents from which eco flows freely, and some have been capped off so that the eco is sealed back. There must be a way to turn the capped vents on. I traced part of the pipeline back to the Forbidden Temple. Maybe you should look there for some type of switch. I am rather impressed with how expressive they managed to make these very low-resolution characters. They've got so little to work with in terms of poly count and texture resolution and all that stuff, but they get quite a lot of personality out of it all the same. Even if I'm not a fan of the over gesture acting they do, they do definitely manage to get a lot of personality out of it. I'm sure if you looked inside the Precursor Forbidden Temple, you'll find a way to turn on that capped blue eco-vent on Sentinel Beach. Actually, speaking of expressiveness, I should talk a little bit about how they do the face animation in a game like this. And we might get a little bit technical here, and I'm not all that technical myself, so I'll, I'll explain it as best I can. There are generally two methods for animating a 3D character's face in a video game. The method that's more commonly used these days is to rig up the character's face with bones, just like you would the rest of their body rig, so that you've got lots of bones to help you control all the individual parts of the face. The lips, the eyelids, the eyeballs, the jaw, the tongue, the mouth, cheeks, all the different parts of the face that you would need to move to make the character make expressions. And that's how a lot of games will do it now these days. But that wasn't always the most practical method for games on older hardware like the PlayStation 2 or earlier. The number of bones that you could afford to have per character was much lower, so you probably couldn't afford to have tons of bones up in the face. So the method they used instead, and it's one that you will still see used today sometimes, is to use blend shapes, or morph shapes. I've heard both terms used. So the way that blend shapes usually work is to, rather than having tons of bones in the character's face that the animator is moving around, the team will create a bunch of expressions for that character in advance. They will make multiple copies of that character's face model, and they will manually adjust and reshape each one of those face models to make a specific expression or to move some part of the face in some way. Maybe they'll have one face that's built with its mouth open all the way. Maybe they'll make one face where the character's eyes are closed. Maybe they'll make another face where the character is smiling or just smiling on one side. And they will build dozens of expressions that way. And then what the animator will do, rather than manually moving bones around to create those expressions, basically the animator will operate a bunch of sliders to have the head morph between those different modified shapes and use that to animate the character. If you want to learn about this more in depth and hear it explained by somebody far, far more qualified to talk about it than I am, I recommend going and watching this video right here. This video is from a series called How Did They Do That? And every episode goes into a lot of detail explaining the tech behind some specific aspect of a certain game. He's done episodes on like the water in Super Mario Sunshine and how they animated eyes in Twilight Princess and just all sorts of really interesting stuff. I highly recommend watching all of them. But yeah, if you want to learn more about the morph shape method of animation they used in this game, that video is only a few minutes long and he explains it way better than I did, so go watch that real quick and then come back. No, don't tell me that you two have problems as well. The first I hear of monster sightings near the village and now this. See those gears up there, boy. See them? See how they're not moving? Yeah, I know I said it already, but these performances are just a little too busy. Like, they're animating a big gesture and a big body move for every little fluctuation in the voice actor's read. Which, I mean, on the one hand, it is nice seeing the voice actor's lines and reads, like, actually physically reflected in the character's performance. That's part of what makes them feel so much more expressive than a lot of other video game characters when they're talking. But yeah, it's just a little too far. Oh, and, and another thing, if by any chance you're interested in making a contribution to my re-election campaign, I, I might be willing to part with yet another power cell. The minimum contribution is, a, oh, a very modest 90 precursor orbs. Oh my goodness, I just realized 
Daxter doesn't always play the exact same animation for all of the attacks you do. Like, his recovery is different sometimes. Like, look at this. Sometimes when you do your little stand-in-place spin attack, Daxter gets swung around in a big loop, and sometimes he'll get spun around and he'll land back on the shoulder and he'll like, whoa, swing his arms, try to catch his balance. Sometimes he'll get swung around and grab onto Jack's hair and yank it back and he's kicking his legs and then he lands back on the shoulder. That's awesome. That What a subtle little touch. And he actually does that on some of the other attacks as well. What a nice touch. Hey! Little furry dude! Oh, I thought for a moment you were my muse. You're what? Yeah, see right here, a character like this would be a perfect opportunity to have a character not moving quite as quickly and frenetically as the others do. And he's not moving around quite as much as some of these other characters do, but I think a character like him with like that sort of hippie voice he has would be a really great opportunity just to create some extra contrast, to have a character whose movements are timed much slower. I see beauty in everything, you know? Right now I couldn't chisel my way out of a box. I think she ran away to that misty island. Oh, I just hope she's all right. It's worth a power cell if you bring her back to me. Wait a minute! We are not going back to Misty Island! Are we? So, uh, you uh, want to make a contribution? Good. A, a sizable one, I hope. You! Yes. Oh, it is a sizable contribution. I, well, 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 I, I just hope this power cell adequately represents my gratitude. I think this is my favorite power cell getting animation right here. Just the slam dunk animation on Daxter looks so good. Hey, you know, for fun, let's break this animation down real fast. Starting out, we got Jack up there looking up to the object he's about to grab, reaching. Before he's even got it in his hand, he's blinking and he's looking in a new direction to where he's about to throw the power cell, which is partly just shows what his thought process is, he's looking to where he's about to throw, but it also helps to direct our eye up toward where Daxter's about to appear. So he throws it behind his back, and before we even get to Daxter, notice that he throws it and then he stays still. Jack actually stays pretty still for the rest of this movement because we're not supposed to be looking at him. We're supposed to be looking at Daxter. Daxter's the center of attention at this point, and Jack really won't make a big move again until Daxter makes contact and slams the power cell in his backpack, or he gets kind of yanked down by the force of it. All right, now let's look at Daxter's motion, and I really like the posing on Daxter here. He enters the frame, grabs the ball, makes contact, hits and really favors this pose up here. He hangs in the air for a while, and it's that iconic getting ready to slam dunk sort of pose. And it's kind of exaggerated because he's holding the power cell in both hands. His arms are way behind him, kind of in a physically uncomfortable way. And I really like the spacing on this move. He really hangs up here and favors this midair pose for quite a while, just so you really see it. And he doesn't start really speeding up until he starts to fall. And then as he starts to fall, the spacing starts to really spread out and speed him up to where he dunks the thing and stretches way down. And I love the way Daxter and Jack's physicality affect each other here, with Daxter slamming the cell into the backpack, which yanks Jack down, but then Jack stands back up straight, which yanks Daxter up into the air, and he just kind of hits a goofy little T-pose there, lands neatly, crosses his arms, and they share a little nod, and then they look at camera. It's a nice little, uh, this is a fun little animation. I like it. And hopefully that little breakdown there helps to show just all the subtle little intricacies involved in animating just that quick little succession of actions and making that whole alley-oop animation feel so good. I mean, you could easily spend two or three days making that one animation. And if you were having to make it to a film quality level, you could easily spend way longer. You know what, I'm actually gonna play through a couple more of these celebration animation sequences in slow motion, just so you guys can get a better look at them.
Hey, I've discovered a couple more attack animations I forgot about. Like this uppercut here. Look at this. So if you crouch down and then attack, you do this really cool looking uppercut, which starts much more awkwardly than it finishes. The first couple frames of it are a little weird. I think there are some subtle ways that this particular one could be polished and improved a little bit. I think these first few frames with Daxter stretched out kind of weirdly in a way that doesn't tie into the motion looks pretty rough. And when I look at the path that Jack's fist and arm take through here before they get to the top of the uppercut, I think maybe that line could be polished a bit more to better kind of tie into this twisting body line of action on the way up to the full extension of the punch. But once you get up to the point where he's reached the top of his jump and the punch has happened and it's just the follow through of that twisting motion from the jump, that all looks great. Legs swing out and Daxter twists around him and he lands really hard. Ah, that looks really good. I don't know, and at full speed, having them kind of flatten out to the ground like that, I mean, it doesn't look great, but maybe it maybe it kind of subtly helps to sell the anticipation before the attack. Mm, I don't know. I'm undecided. I think there's probably a better solution to that problem than what they've settled on. But, uh, I don't know. It works. It's fine. I actually kind of really like this crawling animation, too. I like the little kind of monkey look that Jack gets as he crawls, and Daxter is just kind of riding on his shoulder. And that sort of popping you're seeing on Jack as he walks along, where he just kind of pops to a new angle occasionally. I expect that's because they're having him angled perpendicular to whatever polygon he is standing on right at that moment. And because the ground isn't perfectly smooth, I think every time he crosses one of those edges, he kind of pops as he realigns himself to be perpendicular to that new piece of ground. All right, I think that's enough for Jack and Daxter. Thank you guys for watching. I will be back again soon to talk about the animation in another game. And when I do, I will also talk about the next principle of animation. So I will see you guys soon for that. Thank you for watching.